Good morning, Crossroads. My name is Jen, and I'm so glad to be back with you today. Can you stand and sing as we worship together? Sing with me <laughs> as we worship together. That you weren't beautiful and you didn't belong in your own skin who said that you were all alone and that you're never gonna find love again so many little words so many little lies that have followed you all of your life you're looking for the truth Look into your eyes and you'll see it's been there the whole time. Ooh. Even when you were running, even when you were hiding, never been a moment that you were not perfectly loved. And you barely believed it when your eyes couldn't see it. Every single moment you've always been perfect. ever felt like you just, I don't know, we're in a place where you're like, oh, nobody loves me, everybody hates me, guess <laughs> I'll go eat worms. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this song just reminds me that you don't have to be good enough, you don't have to be, I don't know, glamorous, you just have to be yourself, and God loves you perfectly just how you are, because he created you that way. Mm. Let's do the next song. You came along. 
together. Put me back together. And every desire, every desire is now satisfied. Before you sit down this morning, if you're here in person, tell people how grateful you are for air conditioning before you sit down. Good morning. It is good to worship with you today, whether you're here in person or online. We're so grateful that you're here and that you're worshiping. Um, my name is Tim Ward. I'm one of the pastors here at Crossroads, and I just want to say thank you. Thank you for spending the time to come today. Thank you for being here. On the way in this morning, somebody said, no pressure, but what you're talking about in your message today, I really need to hear. So no pressure. It's all going to be good because God's going to do what God does. And that's my prayer for today, is that wherever you are on your journey, wherever you are in your story, is that God meets you right where you are. The reminder that we just got this morning about how you are perfectly loved exactly where you are. If that's all you hold on today, may it be so. Let it be. So friends, I wanna encourage you to do something. If you're here in person, I wanna encourage you to take out your worship guide. Inside of it, there is a connection card. If you're online, you can do all these exact same things at crossroadsnova.org slash here. But I wanna encourage every single person who's here to fill out one of these. Some of you, and I've said it before, one of the folks in the family will fill out one, but not the rest. I wanna let you know we pray by name for every single card, every single name. So if you want us to pray for you, you don't even have to tell us what to pray for, but if you want us to pray for you, I want you to know we're gonna pray for every single person, whatever your story is, whatever your situation is. In a little bit, 
the ushers will come by and you can place those in the giving baskets or if you're online, it'll go automatically once you hit submit. I wanna tell you about a few ways that you can get connected here at Crossroads over the next few weeks, over the next few months. First thing I wanna tell you about is tomorrow is the deadline to sign up to go to King's Dominion next Sunday. After worship next Sunday, our middle schoolers and high school students are gonna leave here and go to King's Dominion, and I'm sure they're gonna have a blast. I hope they take their Dramamine and that all is well on those roller coasters, because it's less fun when someone doesn't that needs it, am I right? So I wanna encourage you to sign up for that. If you have friends, neighbors, it's a great way to get connected and to get to know people, so sign up for that. Second thing I wanna tell you about is at this church, we take seriously our call to care for our local community. And we have partnerships with a few schools. One of those schools is Trailside Middle School. We have partnerships with some elementary schools as well and a high school. And we are collecting school supplies for this next year. I started to think about it. I can't imagine what it would be like to be a kid showing up to school and not knowing if you're gonna have the things you need for school. And friends, you can make a difference in that. You can also save teachers money because a lot of them, because they love what they do and they're compassionate about their students, will go out and buy it themselves. So friends, if you're able to do that, there's a list online. I went shopping last night and bought things. A list online. There's also an Amazon list. You can have it shipped directly here. But go and do that. Take the time. School supplies are super cheap right now. If you go in the stores, they're at every store. Go make a run. Bring them back. And we would love to collect those by August 13th so we can make sure the students have the supplies that they need. Next thing I wanna tell you about is our Kid Venture program, which is our program for kids, preschool all the way up to fifth grade, is looking for folks to help out in this next year. The goal is to build teams of folks. So on the first Sunday, there's a team of people. On the second Sunday, there's a team. If you're willing to give a Sunday a month to work with kids, to do the commitment that we make when we baptize a child, in a couple of weeks, we're baptizing a couple of kids. That commitment that we make as a church is that we're gonna care for them and walk with them. If you're willing to give a Sunday a month, check the box on the connection card and say, I'm willing to be trained, I'm willing to do it because that's gonna make a difference in the life of a child. There's a lot more things. If you go to our website, if you look in our worship guide, you'll see other things that are going on. Um, I wanna tell you something that's really exciting for me that's happening this summer because we haven't done it in my time here. On Tuesday mornings, there's a group of middle schoolers that come into this church and they hang out and they get connected and they get to know each other and some of those are kids that were in our kids program and now are going into our student ministry and some of them are a little bit older. And actually, we have some high schoolers that are helping out to lead that group, which I think is an amazing thing that our church is doing. Friends, without your generosity, we wouldn't be able to do things like that. We wouldn't be able to make a space so that students can get out of their homes in the summer to come and grow in their faith, to grow in connection with others. So I just want you to know that when you give, it makes a difference in people's lives. You can give online, you can give in a check, you can give through our app. There are lots of different ways you can do it. But I wanna encourage you as the ushers come forward this morning to give. Give generously, knowing that your generosity is absolutely changing the life of middle schoolers. Do you remember when you were in middle school? Mm. It is not easy. And your church is caring for them and walking with them right now. So thank you for your generosity. Ushers, please come forward.
with us, say we stand in awe of you. We stand in awe of you. Yes, we do. We stand in awe of you. Not by might, not by power, by your spirit, God. Send your spirit. Not by mind, not by power, by your spirit, God. Send your spirit, God. What does it mean to forgive? Uh, to forgive means to just completely overlook what went wrong. Forgiveness is uh, accepting a person for uh, what they've done. Just forget what they did and, and not hold it against them. Give them another chance. Look at them with new eyes. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Not take a grudge out on somebody anymore. Just let go of all, you know, your grudges you have against a person. Instead of choosing to hate that person, to love them, despite of what they did. Do you believe yourself to be a forgiving person? Um, yeah, I think I'm a pretty forgiving person overall. It's difficult for me to forgive them at first. It may take a while. I find myself uh, forgiving people, but have, finding a hard time forgetting. I've gotten mad at a lot of things before, but I find that uh, with time, I always forgive people. Do you think it's difficult to forgive certain people? I think it can be. Can you think of anybody that you're not willing to forgive? Um, yes. Um, some friends who, who I trusted personally and, um, took that trust and used it the wrong way. My father and I have had several problems in the past and because he continues to not acknowledge that he's done me wrong, that's one reason, I, that's pretty much the only reason I can't forgive him. Do you believe that God is a forgiving God? Um, that's debatable. Different religions have different ideas. I wouldn't say wholeheartedly, but uh, to a certain extent, I think so. Do you believe that God is a forgiving God? Oh yeah, I wouldn't believe in a God that wasn't otherwise. He'll always give someone another chance. There's no way we could ever be perfect for him, so yeah, he'd have to be forgiving in order to accept us as his children. What do you think it takes to be forgiven by God? Well, that's, everyone would say something different. I think that's between you and God. It depends what religion you are. Some people would say just to pray. Maybe go to your church or your mosque or your um, synagogue or whatever. What does it take to be forgiven by God? Um, a heartfelt apology. Maybe say like a verse from uh, your holy book, like that, along those lines. How do you think you can be forgiven by God? You realize that things can be better despite something that you may have done wrong, and you just find the strength to move on? Really, truly wanting to be forgiven and asking for forgiveness. If you do something wrong, just make it up to the person. Do you think it's necessary to be forgiven by God? In order to uh, um, uh, go on, I guess, and forgive yourself, you would have to know that God had forgiven you and, you know, to kind of take that weight off your shoulders. Do you think it's necessary to be forgiven by God? Yeah, yeah, it depends, like, if it was, like, a major, like, not a major, but, like, if it's a sin, then sure, you might have to go to that level. But if it's something minor, um, then you can do it between your friends and stuff like that. What does it take to be forgiven by God? Um, it takes the blood of Jesus, that's all. I mean, there's nothing we can do but invite him in our lives. That's basically it, and just, just submit to him. I wonder if you might pray with me and for me. God, I pray that in some way today you might speak through me. God, that you would give us ears to hear whatever you want each of us to hear today, that you would open our minds to understanding, that you would open our hearts to be willing to be transformed. Come, Holy Spirit, and do what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. So lots of people have lots of thoughts about forgiveness, don't they? Lots of different understandings, so we're not gonna fix it all today. 
We're not gonna come and figure everything out today, but I hope we can take one step forward when it comes to forgiving ourselves. I read a story a couple weeks ago about a guy named Everett Worthington. He's an expert on the topic of forgiveness, a professor at VCU that studies forgiveness. That's what he does. He's a, he's a professor that really helps people focus and think in the psychology department on, on this idea of forgiveness and what you do. And he tells a story, a struggle that he has about something that happened in his own life. In 2005, his life was turned upside down when his brother took his own life. And this happened because his brother was struggling with PTSD because his brother had witnessed something pretty terrible in his life and he knew that his brother struggled with depression. But I wanna read to you what he says about this concept of forgiveness. He says, my mother had been taken, her life had been taken by a home intruder in 1996 and my brother had discovered her body. He couldn't get those scenes out of his head. I tried to help him, he said, but got diverted by getting swept up in my own adolescent family patterns. I could not forgive myself. Isn't this ironic? A person who studies this, who has a PhD, that has done the work on forgiveness is still struggling to forgive himself. Think about it for a second. If it's that difficult for someone like you, like him, how do you think it is for you and me? It's such a challenge. It's such a reality. We launched this series last week called Freedom, and it's a series on forgiveness, and the idea is that we hold on to things, and as we hold on to things that keep us from truly living, from truly forgiving people, then we're not able to be truly free, right? Jesus says in the scriptures, I've come that you might have life and life to the full. I've come that you might be free, but we can't be free if we're allowing these things to hold on to us. We can't be free if we're allowing a lack of forgiveness of ourselves or someone else to keep us from doing that. Because I imagine it's happened to many of us. There's somebody in our life that we're struggling to forgive or something we're trying to forget, struggling to forgive ourselves for. And as a result, it just sort of eats away at us every single day in every single situation. You know, sure, we might forget about it for a short time, but then something brings it back up, something that's a memory or something that hits. So we're gonna look over these next few weeks, we're looking at this idea of becoming truly free. How do we free ourselves? How do we let things go? In 2015, one of the most catchy slash strange songs I'd ever heard came out. It was by the great theologian Justin Bieber. may have heard. And Justin Bieber sang this song and I couldn't get it out of my head. It was about relationships. Clearly it was about a relationship that had ended, that had finished. And the guy reaches out to the girl and he sings, cause if you like the way you look that much, oh baby, you should go and love yourself. And if, come on, you got it in your head. And if you think that I'm still holding on to something, you should go and love yourself. Now, I'd like to think that this great theologian was talking. Look, it's clear that Bieber's got nothing on me, all right? So I'd like to think that this great theologian was talking about really loving yourself. And this great guy, Justin Bieber, was talking about how to release things and care about yourself, but he's actually talking about someone else in his life that needs to just move on. If you think that I might still love you, just move on, then you should love yourself. But thinking about this message, this entire week, these lyrics have been going through my head, which is both a gift and a burden to hear Justin Bieber over and over (laughs) and over again in your head. But what he doesn't realize probably, I mean, as I understand it, Justin Bieber has a great faith, but what he doesn't realize is that he's being incredibly biblical here. In the second line, he hits the message of Jesus deeply. Somebody asked Jesus at some point in time, if I don't do anything else, if I don't follow any other laws, what are the ones that I should focus on? And Jesus says this, the most important one, answer Jesus is this, hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. So basically love God with all of who you are. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Now maybe you've heard this a bunch of times. 
Maybe you've heard pastors talk about it. Some people mix this up with uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto to you. But the truth is there's a line that most of us miss constantly in this. It says, love your neighbor as whom? Yourself. And the question is, do you have the ability to love your neighbor if you can't love yourself? If you cannot love who God created you to be in the fullness of who you are, can you love your neighbor? Because Jesus intentionally said those words. He intentionally brought it out. If we're holding on to something that we cannot forgive ourselves for, if there is a thing that we wake up every morning and we say, there is one part of me that I cannot wholly submit to God, that I can't give over because it's not good, because it's awful. If that is the thing that is holding us back, how in the world can we love our neighbor? How in the world can we forgive if we can't forgive ourselves? There's something I wanna clarify at this moment in the sermon, and I wanna do this shortly because I don't believe it affects a lot of us here, but some folks are really good at forgiving ourselves for things. Real quickly. So good that we just forgive ourselves for anything we do. Doesn't matter how much we hurt people. It doesn't matter what pain we've brought. We're like, I'm supposed to forgive myself, so I'm just gonna let it go. And it doesn't transform us as people, and we do it over and over and over again, and the pain that it causes other people is a real issue. Or I forgive myself because I believe that the person that I've hurt is just not that good, that they don't matter to God that much. Maybe they're not that smart. Maybe they're not that important. Maybe they're not that valuable. And maybe I won't say those things, but I'm thinking them in my head. Now, I'm not gonna spend much time today on quick self-forgiveness, but I wanna encourage you that if you are one of those people who quickly forgives yourselves and just let yourself move on, let yourself off the hook, there's an action item for you too. I want to invite you to hear in the struggle that others have that forgiveness is not simply about dismissing something, that it's about transformation. Forgiveness is about change. It's about letting yourself off the hook so that you're different in the future, so that you can fully be who God created you to be. Now, when do we need to forgive ourselves? When is that important? It's a, it's a great question. I'm glad you all asked. Thank you. There are things in our life that plague us. There are things in our life that keep us from being free. Maybe these are things from our past, and it's something that happened to you a long time ago, something you did a long time ago, something that someone made you feel bad for, and you can't let go. Maybe it's something that happened last week, but whenever it occurred, it's keeping you from living that full life that Christ has called you to. It's in these moments that we need to pause, take a deep breath, and let go. We have to release those things. Now, it's interesting. Last week, we did a little exercise. If you weren't here, it's okay. You can do this at home. And we had people write on pieces of paper things that they're struggling with, either forgiving someone else or forgiving themselves for. And they brought them up front, and so many people did it. You balled them up, you put them in the trash can, you said, I'm letting them go. And then here's what I know, because we're all humans. Some of you went home and you still held on to it. Some of us went home and we said, I'm still an awful person. I still can't get past that. I still can't get over that. So you did the exercise. You did exactly what I asked you to do. You came up front, you balled it up, you put it in that trash can, and then you walked out and you put it right back in your backpack. And you let it hold you down. Friends, the message of Jesus is that you have the freedom to be free from that. It can be released, you can let it go. I think one of the ways that the Bible refers to these things throughout Scripture is a word that we don't like to use today, a word that we're really uncomfortable with. That word is demons. Boy, you love it when the pastor starts talking about demons in church, don't you? But the Bible uses that term, and so often we think that means that that passage doesn't relate to us because maybe we don't believe in demons today, maybe we haven't experienced demons today, so we dismiss those passages but often demons refer to things in people's lives that are plaguing them, that are holding them back from getting to live. Demons are those things. Sometimes in scripture, a mental illness is referred to as a demon. Sometimes in scripture, 
not forgiving yourself is referred to as a demon. Sometimes in scripture, some habit that harms you is referred to as a demon. So that's the language that I want you to translate this morning. I don't want you to go, well, Tim's saying we all have demons in us. Maybe, maybe it would be better if we use that language these days because then maybe we would try to get rid of it. Maybe we would try to deal with it. But many scholars today argue that when the Bible refers to demons, it's something that's going on in somebody's life that they need to get rid of, that they need to release. So I wanna take you to a passage today from Luke chapter four, verses 31 to 37. It says, then he meaning Jesus, went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath, he taught the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, go away, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. All the people were amazed and said to each other, what words these are. With authority and power, he gives others orders to impure spirits and they come out and the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. Now I wanna give some context about this passage because I never like to just throw things at you without telling you what's going on. Capernaum's a really small town, has a temple in the center. Many of us who went to the Holy Land got to actually go to Capernaum. And we saw where the temple was. This was the temple that Jesus would have done this very thing in the middle of this really, really small town. Now why is that important? It's important to know because the man that was in that town and all the things that were going on with them because it was so small, they all would have known about it. There would have been no secrets. Everybody would have known, this is a guy we wanna stay away from, we're scared of him. There are things going on and we're uncomfortable, so we're gonna leave this guy off and on his own. So I want you to think about, just for a moment, yourself. What might be a modern day demon in your life? What is something that sucks the energy out of you that plagues you, that bothers you. For some people, that thing might be self-worth. You struggle with your self-worth and that's a thing in your life where you look at people and you go, I'll never be as good as that person, I'll never be as cool as that person, I can't be like that. Some of you, there's a habit in your life that sucks the life out of you. It's something that you do that hurts yourself or hurts other people. Whatever you may have, I want you to think about it Maybe you wrote something down last week and then you left and said, that's not going anywhere, right? That's the demon that you hold on to, the thing that you hold on to. It's the thing that you can't forgive yourself for, that I can't forgive myself for. The thing that I say to Jesus, get away. Because God, if you get too close, I might have to deal with this. I don't wanna deal with it. And you put up these boundaries and these barriers to say, Jesus, don't come too close, just like the man and the story says, please don't deal with me. Now we don't know how long this guy's lived in this town. We don't get that background, but as I said, we know that people know him. We know that people know his story. Everyone would have at least noticed him. The man comes to the place where he believes he can actually get the demon out. He's in the church. Why in the world do you think he went there? He went there because he wanted something done. He wanted freedom. He wanted life to be different. He risked humiliation of everyone knowing the problem and he goes to that place. So friends, what do we look at this passage? How can we learn from this? How can we learn about dealing with our own forgiveness of our own selves? Here's the first thing, we have to name it. We have to speak it out loud. That's what happens in this scenario. We name it, we put it out there for the world or at least name it to ourselves. We have to name this thing that plagues us. Now, you know what it takes for some people to name it? It takes true therapy. Friends, I think a therapist is a gift. Go, experience it, name it. But we have to name it. This man steps into a very seriously public place to allow his demon to be named. In this story, the demon knows who Jesus is. Guess what? Your demon knows who Jesus is too. 
Your thing that plagues you, your lack of forgiveness knows that if you let Christ too close to your life, Jesus is going to do something. So you fight it. There are people who have come to me who said they could not come to this church for six or eight months because they were embarrassed by something that was going on in their lives. You know what? That's your demon saying, I don't want to be too close to Jesus. Because what will happen when you come into this place is we're going to love you in the midst of it. We're gonna walk you through the midst of it. So as you name it, recognize that when you name it, Jesus wants you to be free from it. So when is a time to forgive yourself? How do you know now is the moment? One time is when you can't apologize to somebody. Maybe they're already gone in the story, like the story of Everett in the beginning. His brother was already gone, and he couldn't apologize that he didn't walk with him. Right? He couldn't apologize that he wasn't there for him. He couldn't apologize that he didn't want to sit with him in the midst of that. And listen, there's no judgment for me on Everett. That's hard work. It's really, really difficult work. But when somebody has already gone on that you need to forgive, uh, that, that you need to forgive yourself something from that you've done to them, you need to just do it. You need to put it out there and let it go. Perhaps you've done something to hurt somebody that you can't talk to anymore. Not because they're gone, but because your relationship doesn't afford that. You can still forgive yourself without telling them. Somebody asked that question last week. You can forgive yourself without telling them. You can do that work to begin to set yourself free. I've talked with people who've gone through divorces that were really, really messy, and you don't feel comfortable safely going back to being in conversation with somebody. You can forgive yourself. You have the freedom to do that work. It's in these situations, friends, where we have to, we need to allow Christ to call this thing out of us and get rid of it. Here's a second time we need to forgive ourselves. It's when we can't fix whatever we broke. Maybe you feel like you're in a marriage that seems irre irreparable. That really happens. And you've done all these things and you've tried to go to therapy and you've done these things. And maybe you just have to forgive yourself. Because maybe in forgiving yourself, you can love your partner again. Maybe you can walk through that. Maybe you've hurt a family member so badly that it's something that you just can't make a phone call and all will be well. But ultimately, you have to forgive yourself. Otherwise, you'll be in that burden consistently and eternally. Ultimately, we should forgive ourselves when we're truly sorry. That makes a difference, friends when we're truly sorry. I said it last week, but I'm sorry but should not be a sentence. I'm sorry but should not be a sentence. I'm sorry but you did this to me. I'm sorry but you're awful. I'm sorry is a complete sentence. And then hopefully we wanna truly change. When we're truly sorry. You know what's cool about the man with the demons? He goes to the synagogue because he wants to change. He wants it gone. He wants it out of him. He doesn't want it to plague him anymore. And I wonder if some of you guys are in that exact place today. I wonder if you're in a place where you've been holding on to something for so long, pain for so long, and you just simply need to go today and find yourself a quiet spot and release it. You know what some people do? They actually go out somewhere into the middle of a field or on a hike or somewhere, and they just scream it out and release it to let it go but then you have to do the work of truly letting it go. Naming it's not enough. You gotta name it, let it go, and begin to move on in the journey. Forgiving yourselves is part of the greatest commandment. It's a reminder that God loves us first and that we're called to release it and let it go. Friends, when we release things, it gives us the capacity to forgive others as well. You know how hard it is when you're holding on to something yourself to forgive somebody else that does something? It's actually great humility to forgive yourself. I know that's hard to believe. But sometimes our pride gets in the way. I don't wanna forgive myself because if I forgive myself, I have to name that I've done something wrong, but I know that I've done something wrong because it's plaguing me and I'm holding on to it and I can't release it. Humility is required for releasing it. Friends, I truly believe that we can be freed from the demons in our lives. I 100% believe it. 
And I don't tell you this because I figured it all out. I tell you this because I walk through the same situations that you all do. I walk through the same realities of holding on to things in ways that I've hurt people throughout my life or even ways that I think I might have hurt someone and caused them pain. But I think that Christ came to free us. I mean, Jesus names it. In that scripture in John 10, he says, I've come that you might have life and life to the full. Jesus came to give us that release. He came so that we wouldn't have to hold on to those things and those burdens. That's the deal. And that's what he wants for you and that's what he wants for me. This morning, we're gonna receive communion because we do it every single week. We think it's really, really important here. And I wanna invite you to do something after you receive. I wanna invite you after you come up and you either get the prepared cup or the bread and you've dipped it in the cup to go back and sit in your seat, eat it before you carry it. But I invite you to go back and sit in your seat and to be still. And there's gonna be a beautiful song going on and if the lyrics of that song hit you in that moment, that's fine as well. But to be still and maybe have that moment right here, right now in this moment where Jesus says, let it go. Maybe have that moment right now in this space where Jesus says, whatever that demon is that you're holding on to, you're free, get out and let it be. Whatever that scenario is in this morning, give yourself, even if it's 20 seconds, space to let it go. Whatever you're holding on to. We celebrate communion here every Sunday. And we do it because we believe that Jesus says every single person, every single person, no matter what your story is, no matter what your background is, is welcomed at the table. And we think we need reminders as often as possible to receive, to experience Christ meeting us in the midst of the table. There's nothing you can do to earn coming here and there's nothing you can do to keep you away because Jesus has the power to cast any demon out of our lives whatever it is. So the ushers will direct you when to come forward. There are four stations and a gluten-free station in the middle if you need that. Every station has the prepared cups and the gluten-free cups as well. But when you come to one of the stations, if you're gonna receive the bread and dip it in the cup, place your hands out. A piece of bread will be placed in your hand and you can take that and dip it in the cup. And then return to your seats and let that be a space of stillness. Now last week, before we received communion, I gave you just some space to write. I'm not gonna give you space to write this week, but I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds to be still, to be quiet. Maybe you wanna name something to God this morning. Maybe you wanna ask for forgiveness this morning. Maybe you wanna confess something, not because God needs it, but because we need it. So I give you the space, take the space, just for a few seconds right now. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread as he sat around the table with the disciples, as he talked through so many of these things with them, he took bread, which was a common food, and he gave thanks to God, and then he broke the bread. And he gave it to those disciples, and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. As often as you eat bread, remember me. Maybe as often as you eat bread, remember how much I love you. Maybe as often as you eat bread, care about the things that I care about. Maybe as often as you eat bread, love people and love yourself. When the supper was over, Jesus poured into the cup and he took the cup and he gave thanks to God. And he gave it to the disciples and he said, hey, drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, the new promise poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink from the cup, remember me. Let's pray. 
pour out your Holy Spirit, oh God, on all of us that are gathered here and online and over these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we might be the body of Christ for the world, recognizing that we're redeemed by his blood. By your Holy Spirit, make us one. One with Christ, one with each other, one in connection to all the world until Christ comes again in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet at a time where forgiveness will no longer be necessary. God, give us a glimpse of that in our own lives right now and let us forgive ourselves in Jesus' name, amen. Invite those who are serving communion to come forward and as soon as they're in place, the ushers will direct you where to go and where to stand. But please know, as I said, all are welcome.
right, you're not done yet. So here's one of the great things about music. I can't get Justin Bieber's song out of my head, right? I don't want you to get this song out of your head. So I'm gonna invite us to stand, if you're able, and I'm gonna invite us to sing this song together. Now afterwards, I'm gonna ask you to do me a favor, so don't let me forget for the favor I'm gonna ask you, but let's stand together and let's sing this song, and I hope you're singing it all the way home. Cause I'm no longer
Friends, don't let fear hold you back from being who God created you to be. I'm gonna ask some folks, if you're able to, stick around. We're trying to stack chairs in here today, all of them. We're gonna get the carpets clean this week. We don't want them more than six high. If you do seven, ooh. <laughs> you better be afraid. Not five, not seven, but six. Lisa's gonna be here, I think, to help. If you have questions, stack them. Just stack them where they are. But friends, go. Go knowing that God so deeply loves you that God wants to release you from that thing you don't want to release yourself from. Yeah. And have a popsicle on the way out. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Y'all can stay and sing this one too if you want. I said the word. Yeah. 